Good evening, everyone. It is Wednesday. It is July the 22nd, 2020. It is currently 6.06 p.m. Central Time. I'm here at Victory Baptist Church. I'm here for the Wednesday evening service, which begins at 7 p.m., but I've been here now, what, since 2 o'clock today? I've been live on the air. I don't even know how many hours I've been live on the air so far today. I've been alive on the air a lot today, but I'm sitting here at the back of the sanctuary, and uh, wow, how can I describe the scene? I currently have in front of me, and, and I'm not going to try to exaggerate here, one I'm going to count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. I move that. 31. I have 31 books <laughs> around me right now. 31 books. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a mess. It's a mess. And um, I'm sitting here. And I'm I'm contemplating, I'm thinking, I'm meditating, I'm trying to figure out a very important concept, all right? And, and, and I've got to put this together. Now, the goal for this episode is a devotional kind of study um, on the book, The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis, all right? This summer, I'm trying to get everyone to read this book, trying to get everyone to read this book, trying to spark conversations, discussions about it trying to get everyone to study and read Proverbs chapter 2 this summer, right? I have, a, I have a very specific agenda in mind. There's so much happening in the world that we need to get our minds focused on things that are spiritual, right? Proverbs, we need the wisdom of God. And Thomas Akempis, this is a book just to challenge you, to get you to think about theological concepts. So I, I really have a specific goal in mind uh, this summer, and I don't know if I'm pulling it off. I don't know if I'm going to accomplish it, but I'm trying. All I can do is try what people do with my trying. It's up to them, right? It's like, you know, the old say you can take a horse to water, but you can't make it drink, right? I can take, I can bring you these ideas. What you do with them is up to you. But or so I'm stuck, <laughs> okay? I'm, I'm stuck. And here's the reason why. On Sunday, now I, I was not happy with the sermon in any way, shape, or form, but even though I wasn't happy with the sermon, um, this is one of the situations the subject matter should have arisen beyond the subject matter is uh, goes beyond my poor attempt to communicate it, right? I don't think anyone liked the sermon. I don't think anyone was impressed with the sermon. But in spite of it, everyone should have still been preoccupied with the subject because we're trying to figure out, we're in the book of Romans, we're, we're in chapter 5, we're doing a study on the doctrine of sin, and we've come to this idea, is all sin equal? Is all sin equal, right? How do we view sin? Now, we talked about our legal standing before God, and we realized that if we could, like, look, we're guilty before God and Adam. We're guilty in God and our nature. And if we break one law, we're guilty of all the law. So our legal standing before God, one sin is no more different than, our, and, than another sin before our legal, uh, our legal standing before God, because we're all guilty before God, and we're all forgiven the same way by the finished work of Jesus Christ and the imputed righteousness of Christ. So when it comes to our position and our legal standing before God, there's an equality to sin. Now, when it comes to how that plays out in everyday life and practicality, how do we view it? How do we handle this? Uh, is there different consequences? How do we work all of that? And, and there's all there's so many questions, it's hard to even know how to, to frame that argument in that discussion. But there seems to be one thing that comes up over and over when you get into this debate about not all sins are equal and we don't treat all sins the same. And a lot of this flows from the Catholic understanding because the Catholic understanding separates sin into mortal to mortal sin and venial sin. And one of the key elements in determining the seriousness of sin or, or the level of guilt that sin brings about is this idea of knowledge. The more you know, the more guilt you can you can experience the more the more guilt uh, you can bring about. All right, um, 
Knowledge seems to be a major element in this discussion. And you can go read the Catholic Catechism on this subject. You can go listen to our teaching on the Catholic Catechism on mortal and venial sin. It's uh, under the Non-Catholic Catholic Podcast. You can look at the Catholic teaching, and this idea of knowledge is very, I mean, the, your, the amount of knowledge determines how much guilt you end up acquiring it be, it begins it begin how much guilt your your sin deserves depends on your knowledge and i'm really always bothered by this concept because it seems to been then there seems to be an easy way to avoid then guilt there's an easy way to avoid all of the danger that is just to abstain from knowledge absolutely as much as you can but proverbs 2 if you've been listening to our study of proverbs we're told to seek it, to get God's wisdom, to get understanding so that we can understand the fear of the Lord, that we can understand the knowledge of God. It, it, it seems the Bible is saying, get knowledge, get knowledge, get knowledge, get, get spiritual knowledge, get spiritual understanding. Well, the more knowledge we get, if that produces the greater amount of guilt, then why get the knowledge if all it leads to is more guilt? Because we know we're all going to sin. We're all going to sin against the knowledge we have because we're sinners by nature. We're sinners. We are sinners. So how does guilt work this way? And it's very interesting. If you've ever read the uh, classic novel Frankenstein, this was a major theme in the book, the danger of knowledge, the pursuit of knowledge and the danger that, that is connected with it. The more knowledge you have and the more you pursue this knowledge, can it lead to then ultimately a monster, the, this pursuit of knowing and knowing and trying to get and trying to get this knowledge doesn't create these situations. That's a major thing that's been explored in major discussions about the, the Frankenstein novel. Um, sadly, you have people read it and just like, oh, it's a book about a monster. Okay, it's like there's more to it than that. Okay, but that's a whole different discussion. That's a whole different discussion. I was going to use some quotes from the book to demonstrate that, but then it was going to turn into a discussion about that. Obviously, I'm bringing this up because it has something to do with the imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis. And you're going to see how this plays out here, right? So we're in book one of the imitation of Christ. I've got two uh, translations here. We're in book one. We are in chapter two. All right. Book, uh, we are in book two. Uh, book, oh, book two. Book one, chapter two. And I'm going to just read from the beginning of chapter two and uh, get to the section that I really want you to think about, because he's going to bring up this concept that, hey, knowledge gets you more guilt. Knowledge only brings more guilt. Well, then, I, then I'm like, okay, Thomas, Thomas Akempis, then I'm going to be as dumb as I can be. I'm going to be as ignorant of spiritual things as I can be. I'm never going to read a Bible. I'm never going to go to church, and then I'm good to go. So how does this work? Well, let's see what he has to say. All right. Thomas Akempis, The Imitation of Christ, Book 1, Chapter 2. I'll begin at the beginning. There is naturally in every man a desire to know, but what profiteth knowledge without the fear of God? Better of a surety is a lowly peasant who serveth God than a proud philosopher who watcheth the stars and neglecteth the knowledge of himself. He who knoweth himself well is vile in his own sight, neither regardeth he the praises of men. If I knew all the things that are in the world and were not in charity, what should it help me before God? Who is to judge me according to my de deeds? Now, this first paragraph in chapter two of book one sets up this idea of knowledge without the fear of God. If we don't fear God, then knowledge is useless. And we will argue, the biblical argument would be without the, the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge, that we cannot have true spiritual knowledge without the fear of God. So if we pursue knowledge without the fear of God, then it's just fleshly knowledge. There is a danger there. It will puff up. It will make one arrogant. It will make one conceited. It will make one condescending. It will be damaging to you spiritually. So knowledge without the fear of God is a dangerous thing, but you have to have the fear of God because it is the beginning of true knowledge. So there is a connection there. Okay, so we can understand paragraph one. That makes sense. Let's go to paragraph two. Rest 
from an inordinate desire of knowledge, for therein is found much distraction and deceit. Now, I struggle with this, all right? So, so you don't want an inordinate desire for knowledge. You don't want to be overwhelmed with this desire to know, to know, to know, to know, to know. Okay, well, ah, I struggle with this. Those who have knowledge desire to appear learned and to be called wise. Many things there are to know which profiteth little or nothing to the soul. And foolish out of measure is he who attendeth upon other things rather than those which serve to his soul's health. Many words satisfy not the soul, but a good life refresheth the mind and a pure conscience giveth great confidence towards God. All right, well, the only way I can understand paragraph two is to rest from an inordinate desire to know apart from the fear of God. This is just to know, to know. It's not a spiritual knowledge. It's not a spiritual understanding. It's a fleshly desire to know with a fleshly desire to appear knowledgeable and to appear smart before men. This is about you wanting to appear a certain way. You want, you want to be recognized and known and seen and respected for your knowledge. This is all about a fleshly, earthly knowledge. We have to be careful of an inordinate desire to know just to know, not to take that knowledge to bring us to a greater understanding of God and a greater fear for God. I think that's kind of the warning in paragraph two. All right, now this brings us to paragraph three. Here we go. I'm gonna, I may read this from two different uh, translations. Oh boy, here we go. The greater... And more complete thy knowledge, the more severely shall thou be judged unless thou hast lived holy. Now stop right here. Now clearly this is speaking of a spiritual knowledge. The greater and more complete thy knowledge, the greater and more complete thy spiritual knowledge is, that was the only way to understand this, the more severely where thou be judged, unless thou hast lived holy. Therefore be not lifted up by any skill or knowledge that thou hast, but rather fear concerning the knowledge which is given to thee. If it seemeth to thee that thou knowest many things and understand them well, know also that there are many more things which thou knowest not. Be not high-minded, but rather confess thine ignorance." Why desirest thou to lift thyself above another when there are found many more learned and more skilled in the scripture than thou? If thou will know and learn anything with profit, love to be thyself unknown and to be counted for nothing. Now, that last part is so convicting. But before we get there, we have to deal with this concept. And I don't know how to wrap my mind around this from a spiritual perspective. So so let me try to work through this. All right, clearly, there is earthly, fleshly knowledge. Clearly, what we should desire is a spiritual knowledge, to know God. We we want to know God. We want to know the fear of God. We want to, to know the fear of God because the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. But we want to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We want to grow in the understanding of Scripture. But there is a warning here that knowing, that knowing is dangerous. That knowing makes you more responsible before God. Knowing will get you judged more severely. Knowing increases your guilt. Knowing will, what it will lead to is you acquiring more guilt and more responsibility. Now, as a result, people then develop the, the mindset, and I mean, obviously Thomas Akempis was a Catholic, that the idea is simple. Hey, if you know more, then this can lead to mortal sin, which can lead you to lose the grace of God and then all of the consequences that flow from it. So it seems to me the most, the, the most logical conclusion I could come to is then don't learn anything about God. You say, well, you'll miss out on all the blessings. Well, no, 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 I don't. Because what blessings matter are not the temporal blessings, it's the eternal blessings. And if the eternal blessings, I have a greater chance of experiencing more eternal blessing by not knowing, then why would I want to know? Because knowing 
then makes me, puts me in graver danger, not only now, but puts me in graver danger for eternity. Why would I want to know? Now, many Protestants carry the same idea. Well, if, if, you know, if you, if you know, then you're going to be judged more severely than those who don't know. Now, are you saying more, judge more severely in my rewards? So now, if that's the case, so then there's a, there's, there's two Christians. One, one studies, 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 has all of this knowledge. And because he doesn't live according to that knowledge perfectly, he loses more reward. But here's a Christian who never knows, never reads, never studies, and he gets more reward? Well, wait, how does that work? Now, I can understand that knowledge creates a responsibility. I understand that. If you know that someone across the house, across the street and their house is being beaten and you do nothing, well, that knowledge makes you responsible. If you don't know, well, I mean, the person's still being beaten, but if you don't know, you're not held responsible. I can can understand this from a very earthly concept, but how does this work spiritually speaking? Again, look, look at what Thomas Kempis says, all right? I'm going to go back and read it again. He says, The greater and more complete thy knowledge, the more severely shall thou be judged, unless thou hast lived holy. Therefore, be not lifted up by any skill or knowledge that thou hast, but rather fear concerning the knowledge which is given to thee. We should actually be afraid of the knowledge we get. It should lead us to fear, and we should not be lifted up. Now, I agree. We don't want to be lifted up. We don't want to be prideful. When knowledge puffs up, it's because we're missing the fear of God. I completely agree agree with that. But he goes on to say, If it seemeth to thee that thou knowest many things and understand them well, knowest also that there are many more things which thou knowest not. We always need to be aware of what we don't know. I, I think, I think true knowledge will always lead you to what you don't know. If knowledge only leads you to think you do know and puffs you up and you become arrogant and you become conceited, then that then most likely you've stopped in your pursuit of knowledge. You gained a little knowledge. You stopped. You did not continue to pursue it because if you continue to pursue knowledge, you will find yourself realizing what you don't know. The education is the process of of learning what you don't know. That's what education is. Education is the process of you learning that you're an idiot. Okay? Education is the process of learning that you're stupid because the more you continue to learn, the more you realize you don't know. The minute you think you know and you continue learning, you realize you don't know. So I can agree with all of that. I can agree with all of that. And then he goes on to say, let me read it to you one more time. If it seemeth to thee that thou knowest many things and understandeth them well, knowest also that there are many more things which thou knowest not. Be not high-minded, but rather confess thine ignorance. Why desire there to lift thyself above another when there are found many more learned and more skilled in the scripture than thou? Now, are you just learning so that you can know more? Now, that's a danger. I agree with all of that. I agree with every bit of that. My concern is the concept that knowledge leads to a greater judgment. It leads to more guilt. Because the only logical conclusion then is not to know. And that just can't be, that's not the biblical mindset. The biblical mindset is get the knowledge, gain knowledge, seek understanding, seek to know God. Now, it it clearly seems to imply that we must fear God, that any knowledge that any knowledge obtained that does not have the fear of God around it, controlling it, that knowledge will only lead to arrogance, condescension, pride, puff you up, and it's dangerous. But so so we are to we are to have the fear of God so that we can have correct knowledge. And then we are to grow in that knowledge so that we can grow in our our spiritual understanding and our relationship with God. But if knowledge is going to get you judged more severely, I just don't know how Christians process that idea. Hey, you need the knowledge. You need the knowledge. But just understand now, you're going to be judged more severely. Well, then why did I get the knowledge? So it's an interesting concept that Thomas Akempis brings up. Now, if I read that in light of the Catholic catechism, which I have to, 
then the Catholic Catechism explains knowledge is one of the key elements when it comes to mortal sin. I have to know. If I do it out of ignorance, it can be a venial sin. If I do it knowingly, it's a mortal sin. And if it's a mortal sin, I can destroy the grace of God and end up dying outside of the grace of God, and then it can end up in hell. The Protestant system doesn't look at it that way. Or, 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 well, we say we don't look at it that way, and then you'll have Protestants argue that not, not all sins are equal. Okay, so do we have a, so do, this, is this how the Protestant system works? We have, we don't have mortal and venial sins before God, but we have the concept of mortal and venial when it comes to the church, when it comes to each other and how we judge each other's sins. Well, then do, do we have that system articulated? Do we have a clearly an articulated system where it's clearly explained? At least the Catholic Catechism has an, a, a section on it. Where is the section in Christianity that says, okay, here's how it works. If you, if you have knowledge, if you do this and you do that, that's a more serious sin than if you don't. And here are the consequences if you do. Now, and again, who assigns the consequences? We assign the consequences? Or are you speaking in the natural consequences? It's just a weird concept that is very prevalent within Christianity. Knowledge equals more guilt. Knowledge helps you acquire more guilt and more responsibility. All right, I understand that to some level. I'm not denying that there's some concept there, but how does that play out in your spiritual life, my spiritual life? How does that play out? I mean, it would, it would seem to mean become a Christian and never know anything. And then I will not acquire greater guilt and greater responsibility. And you say, well, no, 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 no. You're supposed to acquire the, the uh, responsibility and the greater judgment because, well, it just makes no logical sense to me. Put yourself in a position where you'll be in greater spiritual danger. Now, when it comes to the church and how we handle people, I, I, I do understand that obviously we're going to take knowledge into consideration. I mean, we're not, we're not going to hold a new Christian the same level responsible as someone who is older, but, but what do we do? Now, you've been saved for a couple of months. You've been saved for a year. You've been saved for 15 years. You committed the same sin that person committed. That person, we're not going to do much, but for you, we, we, you know, we stone the heathen. I think it's a concept that we have to explore. Now, there's there's a powerful, powerful, powerful quote there at the end here. I'm going to read it in a different translation. There's a powerful quote here that I have um, highlighted in my copy of the book. If you will know or learn anything profitably, desire to be unknown and to be esteemed as nothing, well, that is a powerful quote. If you will know or learn anything profitably, if you're truly going to know anything, if you're truly going to learn anything and it's going to be a profit, you have to desire to be unknown and to be esteemed as nothing. In other words, if you take knowledge and what you want from that knowledge is to be known, to be esteemed, to be respected, to be famous, then guess what? That knowledge is of no profit. If you if you get the knowledge, seek to be to be unknown, not to be esteemed, to be to be just nobody even knows who you are. In fact, again, the exact words in my translation of the book is I read them exactly. Uh, desire to be unknown and to be esteemed as nothing. If you want knowledge for any other purpose than that knowledge of leading you to God, helping you grow in God, helping you grow closer to God. If, 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 if you want it for any other reason, then, 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 it's, then it's not profitable. It's, it's dangerous. Now, I do agree there. There is danger there because we all want that. I have all kinds of degrees, but do, did I want those theological degrees so that I could, could let everyone know, my, know that? Now, I've tried to be very careful. Now, look, I am just, I'll make this very clear. I am just as vulnerable to these desires as anybody else. I've taken extreme measures to try to avoid that. When I became a pastor, they want to put my name on the ch ch church sign. I said, no, it's not about me. It's not about me. I don't, I don't want to put my name on, on anything on our, on our websites, anything. I've never wanted to 
no matter when early on now i don't want to, i never wanted to put you know be uh you know uh, b- b- like, like putting out all the letters for my associates for my bachelors for my masters i didn't want to, i don't i don't want to, i don't want any of that Do, I, I don't want to you know if, if i would have pursued my doctorate's degree i i i could call myself doctor no 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 um I didn't want any of those de- degrees. Li- I don't put those degrees down. I don't list those degrees. I don't even list my name as the host of the podcast. I don't I do not do that. When I did have social media uh, way back, I didn't even use my real name. Because I, I, I always wanted, like, when I was on social media, I really wanted it to be about discussions and concepts and philosophy and talking, not about personality. I never wanted the church to be about me. I wanted it to be about what we're trying to do, that we were trying to do something unique, that it's not Victory Baptist Church, pastor me. No, it's just Victory Baptist Church. The name of the pastor is irrelevant. And maybe that's stupid because so many churches are built on pastors, you know, you know, um, you know, if you look at, if you, if you look at some churches, uh, you know, it's like if you look at many ministries, it'll be the name of the ministry, and then they'll they'll put with that, you know, like Evolution Church with Pastor Stephen Furtick. They'll put the name of the person because it becomes personality driven. Now, the reason I say that is not because I'm more spiritual; it's because I know that it's easy to become. Then it's about me. See, I got this knowledge; it's about me. And if I want my knowledge to be profitable, it cannot be about me. I've got to I've got to be as as Thomas Akempis said, I'm going to read the exact words. I got a desire to be unknown and to be esteemed as nothing. If if my knowledge is going to be profitable, I've got to be esteemed as nothing, to be unknown. Because then the knowledge is about me being known. Now, that's a hard way to think about it. Now, I, I don't, I have a hard time with what Thomas Akempis is saying in regards to knowledge equals a greater judgment because I, I still don't know how we play, I still don't know how we, create a system where this works. Like Protestants talk about, well, you'll get the greater judgment. And, and then well, like, what's the system? What gets you greater judgment? What does that mean? Uh, so you mean someone can go to one level of hell versus a different level of hell, one level of heaven versus like, how does all of this work? And they can never really articulate how the system works. But one thing they constantly try to go back to is knowledge. And I just, I don't know how we understand that. But I do realize that knowledge is dangerous. Knowledge can become our identity. We want to be known for what we know. We want to be know. We want to be known for how much we know. We we want to be known for how smart we are. Now, some people give up on trying to be known for their knowledge, so they want to be known for their looks, or they want to be known for their sense of humor, or they want to be known like there's always these things we seek for our own advancement and our own recognition. What we're supposed to do is die to ourselves and be known simply as being identified with Christ. I think that is very important. So, all right, just just some random thoughts. Uh, I got church starting here shortly, so I can't really completely unpack them. There's a lot there. I don't completely know what to do with all of it. I really don't. Um, I don't. And I'm not going to pretend. I'm not going to pretend that I do know. I, I'm, I mean, speaking of knowledge, I'm not going to pretend pretend that I have the knowledge to know exactly how this works out. That okay, here's two Christians. One knows a lot. The other one doesn't know a lot. So one commits a sin. All right. Now I do understand in a practical sense we may perceive these two differently. But how does it relate to their standing before God? How does that relate to their fellowship with God? How does that relate to their them being judged by God? How does that relate to their eternity? Because, because how, and then how do you answer the fact that not knowing would be the best state to be in spiritually? If I don't know, I can't be held accountable. Does, is, is ignorance an excuse for accountability? I will argue that the Bible doesn't seem to hold that out. You can find a parable here or there that may, may too, but I think in other cases, no one is no man is without no man is without excuse because the things that can be known of God are seen or, or visible. Like there's a level that everyone has a certain level of knowledge. So are you saying that once we get past the initial level of knowledge, if you gain more knowledge, then you gain more guilt? Like how does that I I I don't know how we play all of that out. And and no one's ever been able to 
to, they didn't, no one has sent me the notebook with it all figured out with their system. Okay, here's, here's this guilt. This is a level three guilt. This is a level two guilt. This is a level five guilt. Okay, these are the actions. This is how much knowledge must be acquired. Here are the consequences. And, and like, it's this convoluted system. And I, I don't know that. I do know that um, if I know and I don't act, then yeah, then obviously that's a problem. But isn't it a problem that you don't know and you don't care to know? Yeah, so, all right, I'll stop right there. You can send me your thoughts about Thomas Akempis, this kind of difficult paragraph to unpack. There's a lot there. You should definitely read it, meditate on it, and give me your feedback. Newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. All right, I got to get ready for the Wednesday evening service. We'll be live under the VBC Bible Institute, Genesis 4. We're going to try to make some progress tonight. God bless.